Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this live streamed um, astronomy presentation. Um, Laura Marseglia and Kelly um, Housley will be talking about the night sky in April. I'm Rick Wallace with the Parido Environmental Education Center, or PEAC, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and I will be the moderator for today's talk. Uh, this talk is being recorded. Uh, we are able to offer programming at this time because of our wonderful members and donors, so we'd like to thank all of you for your continuing support. Uh, so now uh, I'd like to ask Laura and Kelly to um, turn on their videos and give you a very brief, brief introduction to themselves and go ahead and start the presentation. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'm Laura. Um, I'm currently a student at Northern New Mexico College, and I'll graduate in May uh, with a degree in radiation protection. Um, astronomy for me is a hobby at the moment. Um, I first started volunteering um, in astronomy related things at Frosty Drew Observatory in Rhode Island. Um, and my goal is to make um, outer space accessible to everyone. Um, hi, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Kelly Housley. I'm a park ranger at Vias Caldera National Preserve. Um, uh, my astronomy is also a hobby for me. Um, my interest in astronomy kind of goes back several years, uh, back to when I first actually saw the Milky Way. I never saw it growing up, so saw it at one of the national parks that I was working at uh, many, many years ago and have been fascinated and interested ever since and like to share it with as many people as possible. Cool, thank you, Kelly. All right, let's jump right in. So as Rick said, tonight I will be talking about the night sky in April. Um, so here's a rough overview of what I'll be talking about today. So let's start with the moon. Um, the moon, um, is the closest celestial body to Earth. It, it goes through phases based on its position around Earth relative to the sun. Um, and they, um, hmm. I gave the time above the horizon for each of these uh, phases because usually they'll give the exact time that the moon reaches first quarter, for example, but I find it more useful to figure out when it's gonna be above the sky when I can actually look at it. So that's what I've done here. Um, this month's full moon occurs at the end of the month. Um, and as every moon, full moon has a name, this one is called the pink moon. It's also a super moon, which means it is at the closest point in its orbit to the earth. Um, now the moon orbits around the earth in an ellipse or an oval um, with the earth being one of the focuses, foci. And so um, the super moon is when the earth is at its closest point. The micro moon um, is when the moon is at its farthest point from the earth. And so here's the difference in size between them. Um, so you can tell that they're not much different, um, especially once you um, compare the, the, once you notice that this is a gradual change, um, it really makes the supermoon kind of a little less exciting um, than maybe the media makes it out to be. But I digress. Um, so features of the moon. Um, we have the mare, which are the hard and lava flows, or the dark spots on the moon, for example, here. Um, and the moon has a high level of albedo, which is how reflective it is. So that is always, that's, that's why during the full moon, you can see your shadows, uh, is because the moon is very, very reflective of the sun's light. Um, another interesting feature of when the moon is in a crescent phase is to look for earth shine. So normally, um, well, no, what we normally see um, is that 
the sunlight hits the moon and then bounces off the moon comes to earth. However, sunlight can also hit the earth's atmosphere, bounce up to the moon and then bounce back um, through the atmosphere to the earth's surface. This happens all the time, but we can only really see it when the moon is at um, a crescent phase so that it, the um, part that's illuminated doesn't you know, outshine the darker part of the moon. Um, a particular point of interest, especially with binoculars, is to look at the moon's terminator. This is the line here between light and shadow. Um, and it is fantastic um, when the moon is in the gibbous phase, because that's where a lot of the detail in the craters are. Uh, specifically Tycho Crater, which is one of the moon's largest craters and shows these beautiful rays um, coming all out from every side of it. So what planets are visible this evening? Well, let's go to Stellarium and look. So we have Mars in the Western sky. Um, so this is actually, I've set it for about an hour from now um, where it's 8 p.m. So let's see if we can find Mars. Here it is. So here is Mars and over the course of time, if I advance the day, um, you can see that Mars will get progressively lower in the sky um, as the month goes on. So uh, look at it while it lasts, especially before it goes behind the mountains. <laughs> um, Jupiter and Saturn are also in the Eastern sky. So if we go to the other part of the sky, um, and they are in the morning. So let's advance time. One, two, three, four, five a.m. And you can see here, Jupiter and Saturn are um, in the southeast part of the sky, coincidentally, right near the moon. Um, so if you have if you have to be an early riser for work, um, it would be a perfect time to catch a glimpse of Saturn and Jupiter. Um, so let's see, where are the other planets? Well, they're all right around the sun, funny enough. So let's make time daytime. Um, oh, it's still focused on Mars, so there's Mars. Um, but let's look and find some of the other planets. So Venus is basically right on top of the moon or the sun. Mercury is, I think, over here a little bit. It's very, very close to the sun as well. Um, and then Uranus is kind of over here and Neptune is like over here somewhere. Now remember, Neptune and Uranus, you can't see without a telescope anyway. And even then they still look like background stars. Um, but as a point of interest, that's where they are. Um, we'll have to wait a little while for Venus and Mercury to be far enough away from the sun to be visible at nighttime. So let's go back to evening time. Lovely. And keep going. So con a conjunction is a phenomenon where two objects look like they're close together in the sky. Um, like I said, the um, Jupiter and Saturn are very close together um, in the mornings and actually, what was it, on the 7th, I think? Let's go back to here. Seven, the moon will be the sixth, let's, yeah, the sixth it was that the moon will be right in between Saturn and Jupiter. So that's gonna look really pretty. The other thing I wanted to talk about um, for conjunctions is what's called an occultation. So that happens. So in this case, it's between the moon and Mars. And it happens when Mars, the path of that Mars takes throughout the sky happens to cross behind the moon in this case. Now this will only be visible in here from um, Southern Asia. And so these dotted lines are when it's technically above the horizon, but the sun would drown it out. It's too bright. So this is, if, you, if maybe you have family in this region, this is the best place to, for this phenomenon to be seen. Um, so spread the word. 
Um, now, for some of you who are curious, I found a video for what it looks like. So this is a time lapse. The whole process takes about four hours, but here it's condensed down to a minute. Um, so here you can see Mars right here down the lower left. Um, and so let's see what happens. So Mars has just gone behind the moon. Um, and as I said, it'll take about four hours for give or take for Mars to reappear. So here you can see the Earth shine a little bit on the moon. Um, here we have some clouds coming in front. Um, and you can see a little bit here, um, since the clouds make the moon like dimmer, kind of the shadows here in the craters along the Terminator, which is really cool. That's a really good shot of Earth shine because he's overexposed it. And there's Mars. So that's what it looks like. It is very rare to happen. Uh, it hasn't happened a while um, in for North America. So um, it'll be exciting when it does happen. Um, so it is happening this month, just not in a place that's available for us to see. All right. Meteor showers. So here we have, oh, why is that playing? No. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, the Lyrid meteor shower. So as you may have guessed, um, Lyrids are for Lyra the harp. So over here, um, here is Lyra the harp. You can see here that it looks like a harp. Let me turn that off. Um, and so the radiant point is, let's see right about here-ish. Um, so the peak is April 22nd, so you need to be facing east. And the time I have it set to is three in the morning. So you'll have to um, either stay up really late or wake up very early. <laughs> um, and the at the peak of the shower, which is April 22nd, you'll see about 10 to 20 meteors per hour. Um, and that is for if you're in a dark sky setting. Um, otherwise, if you're closer to a city, it'll be harder to see some of the dimmer ones. Um, you'll be able to see meteors from the shower about four days before and after the peak. Um, you want it to be between moonset and dawn um, because again, you want dark skies. Um, and so look for Vega. Vega is the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere in the summertime, um, which Vega rises, I think, about 10 p.m. Let's look. 10, 15, 11, 15. So yeah, somewhere in there. Um, and it keeps rising higher and higher in the sky and will peak just before sunrise. Um, so that's the best time to look. Let's see when moon sets. Today, go back in time. Am I missing the moon? I guess so. Oh, here we go, here's the moon. So we don't have to worry about the moon for this shower, but in general, it's good to look for meteor showers between moonset and dawn. Um, so yes, yeah, because here's the moon um, at five in the morning. Anyway, all right. So the the reason I focus on the meteor this meteor shower is because it is after kind of a long dry spell um, between end of January and now. There haven't been a ton. Um, so it's, even though this is, it's kind of a smaller shower, it's still great to have, you know, something to look forward to when you start gazing. All right, let's talk about some constellations that are visible in April. So let's go back to evening time. This is nine o'clock uh, and we'll start in the western part of the sky. So, let me zoom in a bit for perspective. So we have 
Now this is nine o'clock, so you can tell how low Orion is already, right? Um, so here's Orion um, and Canis Major with Sirius, the brightest star in the Northern hemisphere in the winter time. And I think it's even brighter than Vega. So that's really cool. Catch that while it lasts. Um, and we also have the Big Dipper up, where is it? Here we go, over here. This is more in the northern part of the sky, Ursa Minor here. Um, and here is Ursa Major, the Big Bear, and the Big Dipper um, is the asterism, right? And asterism is a group of stars that isn't technically a constellation. Um, so here we are for that. And that's in the northeastern part of the sky here. Um, so yes, so now let's look at the eastern part of the sky. We have Leo up here, um, Leo the lion, Leo minor. Um, and we also had Gemini, very high up in the sky. And here's Mars again. Um, but Gemini, we have the bright stars Castor and Pollux being the heads of the twins, and then their bodies come down towards Orion. Um, in the, in the, so that was the southern part of the sky, and then in the eastern part of the sky right now, we have constellations like Virgo here and Bootes, and if we advance time, we should see Hercules here as well. Um, and then, if we go, so this is, if we go past midnight here, we get um, Vega, right? The bright star Vega and Lyra um, up past the um, horizon and the mountains. <laughs> um, we also have Cygnus the Swan. Um, and then we have the asterism, the summer triangle, which consists of Vega, Deneb, the tail of Cygnus and Altair, the head I believe, yes, of Aquila the Eagle. Um, we also get, if we advance time a little bit more, Pegasus and Andromeda. This is right before um, sunrise. If I turn atmosphere back on, you can see the sunrise is starting to happen. Um, but we get Pegasus coming up, which is really exciting, and Andromeda, where we can see this little blur here, which is the Andromeda galaxy. That's great with binoculars. So there we go. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about today is deep sky objects, things that you can look at with binoculars and telescopes. Um, springtime, is known as galaxy season because the Milky Way isn't in the way, right? Um, the Milky Way is very dense, like what you think of in the summer. Um, and so having that not be um, in the middle of the sky is very helpful for um, looking past the, our own galaxy and at others. So there are tons I wanted to highlight today. Um, let's bring this back to evening. Let's start with the Leo triplet. So that consists of three galaxies, M65, M66, and NGC 3628. So let me zoom in here. So first of all, the Leo triplet, so is below Leo's kind of hind feet, right? So to find Leo, you look for the backwards question mark and then go over, find his feet and tail. The Leo triplet is right below his feet. So here are the three stars or galaxies, excuse me. Um, here, this is M65, this is 66. And then the biggest one here is NGC, oh wait, no. This is NGC 3628. Lovely. So this is a great um, target to look at with binoculars and astrophotography as well. Let me zoom out. And the next one I wanted to talk about are M81 and 82. These are right next to each other, M81. 
These are under the head of Ursa Major. So if we zoom in, we have the, this is called Bode's Galaxy, the bigger one here, and then the smaller one um, is called the Cigar Galaxy because it looks like it's um, a long, thin cigar because we're seeing it edge on. Instead of the Bode's Galaxy, we're seeing face on. Um, so those, again, are under uh, Ursa Major's head and neck. All right, next, let's look at M51, which is at the tail of Ursa Major or the end of the handle of the Big Dipper. And we look at the Whirlpool Galaxy. This one is gorgeous um, because the larger galaxy has a similar structure to the Milky Way in that it is a spiral galaxy, uh, but it also has this other blur over here. So these are two galaxies that are actually merging together. Um, so this is a fascinating target, target to look at. Um, and again, this is at the end of the tail of Ursa Major. Next, let's look at M104, which is in, or to the south of Virgo at the moment. This is called the Sombrero Galaxy. Um, and it has this gorgeous dust lane running right through it. So this is another, like the Cigar Galaxy, it's kind of edge on from our perspective. So we are seeing um, a very dense uh, cloud of dust that runs around the outside of the entire galaxy and that um, obstructs the light from the core of the galaxy, which makes this one interesting. The last couple of galaxies that I wanted to highlight are um, what's called Markarian's chain in Virgo. One of these galaxies is M84, um, just to be able to find it. So this is the whole chain here. Every one of these fuzzy objects, even these dimmer ones out here, these are galaxies. Um, now, some of these are um, gravitationally bound, but not all of them. Some of them just appear to be in this region by coincidence. Um, they're either in front of or maybe behind the rest of the galaxies compared to Earth. So this is, again, a great shot for astrophotography and binoculars as well. And so let me again highlight where it is based on the other constellations. So let's turn on constellation art to kind of get our bearings. So this is at uh, Virgo's kind of shoulder maybe. Um, you can find it um, by taking the bottom of Leo and extending that line a little bit to find it. Um, and it's between Virgo's head and shoulder and Coma Berenices which is a constellation about hair, funnily enough. Other things besides galaxies that I wanted to highlight are the Rosette Nebula, which is NGC 2244, which is over here in the Western sky. So it's setting shortly, but it is a good nebula to look at, um, which is very gorgeous. And it is, um, near um, Orion. And then also, of course, before Orion sets completely for, for the season, we have um, the Orion Nebula, of course. Let me center on that, which is gorgeous. And if you are lucky enough to be in a dark enough sky, you can see a naked eye, which is glorious. Um, and the last thing I wanted to highlight is looking at, so when you are looking for the meteor shower, right, the Lyrids, you can also look for, um, if you happen to have binoculars, you can look for um, Albirio. It is the head of Cygnus the Swan, opposite its tail from the wings. Um, and Albirio, 
I don't know if it'll show us here. Oh, it does. Is a double star. One is very yellow and one is very blue. I think this is one of the best binary star systems in the entire night sky because of that distinct color contrast. Um, so that is all I wanted to talk about today. Of course, um, I have some um, resources to um, that every astronomer should have. I think the most important one I want to highlight is the red flashlight. Uh, why that's important is because you don't want your pupils to um, uh, contract too much when you're um, trying to look at very dim things in the night sky. So red light filters out the blue light that is in white flashlights. Um, and our eyes are very sensitive to blue light. And so when they perceive blue light, they will contract. And so that's why the red flashlight is beneficial because it filters out the blue light. Um, and then these are other specs that I found um, for the, your first set of binoculars for astronomy and um, good telescopes as well. So that's all from me. And now I will turn it over to Kelly to talk about dark skies. All right, thank you so much, Laura. Um, it's it's always fascinating to hear what you can see just with the naked eye, and even some of those uh, those galaxies and the nebula. They're they're awesome to see. So I hope you guys all get a chance to go out and and look at the night sky this month. Um, you know, being able to see and identify the constellations that Laura was highlighting, um, the stars in particular, the planets that are above us. It's been a human tradition for generations, um, but not only has it been a tradition, but years ago, these stories of the stars, uh, the night sky has been a critical part of our lives with seasonal indicators and navigation as well. Um, if you wanna move to the next slide, Laura. So our ancestors, the one before, yeah, that one. <laughs> um, our ancestors were familiar enough with the night sky that they would be able to identify Polaris really regularly. Um, they use that star to travel. Um, and I don't know if you guys can take a look at this one and identify Polaris. I can quiz Laura and see if she can circle it for us because it's in there. All right, so what I like to look for is find the Big Dipper, which it was tricky to find, but I think it's over here, right? The You're right, yeah, handle you've got the handle. And the cup. Yep. And then you take the two stars farthest from the handle, draw a line, and Polaris should be somewhere over here. Am I right? Yeah, Am I it's, close? Right, it's right behind the tree. So it's like that one star in the tree. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, I have another picture like this with the star trails, and it makes it really obvious where Polaris is because all the stars are look like they're rotating around it. Um, but uh, so yeah, our, our ancestors would be able to look at this, not necessarily using that trick and just know where Polaris is in this mess of stars. Um, but we are starting to lose that connection that we have to our past and our ancestors by losing the night sky. Um, so I'm sure all of you are familiar with light pollution or at least have heard the term. Um, you wanna move to the next slide, Laura? Um, but with International Dark Sky Week coming up in just a few days, um, with the theme of being Discover the Night, I just wanted to give you guys a few resources, what it is and what we can do um, to reconnect with the night, our past, and how to reverse the effects of light pollution. Um, so what it is, um, you knew I was going to ask you to turn it. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I grew up, I didn't really know what the Milky Way was. Um, I had a five on this scale here. Uh, it wasn't really until I started working in the national parks, as I mentioned earlier, and I looked up and I was thinking, oh my gosh, that's the Milky Way. And there are so many people that go through that throughout their whole lives, not really experiencing that true dark sky. A lot of people are living in that nine, eight, seven range. Um, so it's, it's hard to actually view the, the stars and, and what our ancestors saw. Um, so what it is, um, if you want to change to the next slide, 
Uh, so I kind of categorize light pollution um, with a couple different things. I usually group a lot of these terms into one category of just upward light. So this is just light um, that isn't going where it's needed or not glaring in our eyes. So anything that's going up towards the sky, essentially, um, that is light that is wasted. So for a lot of lights that are not shielded, up to 30% of the light can be wasted, which wastes electricity and also money, which is always a bummer. Um, but this really starts to block out stars and in larger cities, it does block out the Milky Way. But even far away from cities, as, as you heard me say, I grew up in a suburb and I didn't see the Milky Way growing up. So this can affect people even if you're not directly in a really urban environment. Um, glare to me is, maybe it's just because I get annoyed by it the most, but I think it's the worst type of light pollution because it gets in our eyes and blinds us. Um, this person in the, the graphic is saying my freaking eyeballs, which cracks me up. Um, but basically, I'm sure we've all been there when we're, um, you know, driving at night or walking around at night and we just get light in our eyes from either a street light that's not shielded or car headlights. And um, it, it blinds us to what's around us. So it's just not really a, a safe thing. Um, do you want to change to the next one? So basically, light pollution is light not going where it's needed. I think a lot of people are under the impression when people say, let's reduce or eliminate light pollution, they're thinking, oh, you want us to get rid of all artificial lights. Well, what about my safety? What about being able to see when I'm walking? Um, but reducing light pollution is mainly about redirecting that light and using it smartly and efficiently, using light when it's needed, essentially. Um, humans are very quickly turning into what I like to think of as a nocturnal species, even though it's not literally a nocturnal species, um, but because of all of our advances in technology, we're not waking up when the sun rises and then going to bed when it sets, or at least most of us aren't. Um, but we're not really evolving anything to adapt to this. I, I think it would be really cool if we suddenly had echolocation, but um, we don't have that um, evolutionary advantage. So yes, I think we can all agree artificial light is needed at night, but if we start to change our lighting habits and go from the top picture down to the bottom, directing it where it's needed, that's kind of the goal with reducing or eliminating light pollution. So it does do a lot more than just lighting up the night sky and eliminating the Milky Way. Uh, if you wanna to move to the next one. Um, it does have a lot of negative or adverse effects on our own health and our environment as well. And I'm not gonna go really deep into this, but if you do have questions about it, I can cover it um, in the question and answer session later. Um, but a big one for us is there is a decrease in melatonin production. I'm sure you're aware melatonin helps induce sleep, but it also boosts our immune system and lowers cholesterol. So obviously with a decrease in this production, you get an increase in many different diseases like sleep disorders or depression or obesity or diabetes, the list just goes on. Um, so it's just not a good situation, basically. Um, next slide. It also affects our environment. So there are a lot of animals that have depended on that natural cycle of light and dark um, for migration and mating. Um, monarch butterflies and a lot of different bird species rely on that natural cycle of light and dark, but adding in that artificial light to the atmosphere is confusing them and taking, their off, taking them off from their normal routes. Um, they also, uh, there are some species like fireflies that produce light to help with mating and attracting mates, and our artificial lights are outshining their light that they're producing. So they, they then see a decrease in their population, which we could help by turning off those lights or helping reduce light pollution. Um, next slide. I think this is the, um, the most visible uh, change in the environment, whether this annoys you or not, um, seeing those moths around the artificial lights. 
um, yes, they're attracted to these lights and that takes them out of their natural environment, their natural ecosystem, which in turn takes their predators out of the ecosystem because they're gonna come and get the moths that are easy to find right by these lights. And their predators like bats, for instance, will become easier prey for their predators. So it's kind of this domino effect, um, taking all of these animals, this whole food chain out of uh, their own environment. Um, but the good news is, as sad as all these effects are, we can actually do something about it, and it is entirely reversible. So last slide. So um, I know this feels like a lot of information, but if you want to just start with your own personal bubble um, at your own home, you could just turn off lights that are not needed. It can be as simple as that. Um, you could close the curtains at night and redirect those lights to stay inside rather than letting them letting that light trespass into the, the darkness outside of your house. For your outdoor lights, you can get energy efficient bulbs. Um, this says kind of an automate, automatic timer for using lights only when you need them. So that's a really good idea. If you want lights outside for safety, you could try getting like a motion detector installed. So the light only turns on if someone is walking by. Um, and uh, the really good thing though, um, the really beneficial thing though, is to shield those lights. So like number three says, direct them down. You can see the, the side of the shield goes all the way to the bottom of the light and that will help eliminate that glare. So you want a shield that will cover the light entirely and direct it directly down to where it's needed, which is on the ground rather than in the sky. But if you wanna go a little bit further than that, um, you can spread the word. So education is a really big thing. A lot of people might not know that they could do something really simple to help reduce light pollution. So talking to your friends and family, talking to your neighbors, that can help as well. Um, in addition, trying to get the community involved, if we wanna go the, the extra step, um, you can see in the bottom corner, this join IDA, the International Dark Sky Association, um, is really big on getting communities to reduce that amount of artificial light going up into the sky. But I think what's most inspirational to me is that there are a lot of international dark sky parks and communities that have been certified. And that process a lot of times was started by just one or two people. So that idea that one person can make a difference is definitely true when it comes to trying to reduce light pollution and having more night sky friendly lights in your own community. So it definitely is possible. Um, in addition, you could do some citizen science as well. Um, you could get uh, sky quality meter readings for your phone so you can take measurements of what the sky is like at your home and help by reporting that. Um, the Globe at Night project is a really good one. Um, this one is a website and they usually have campaigns where they tell you to look for like say Leo as, uh, as Laura was mentioning. Um, and you look up, you just go outside your own home, look up and try to find that constellation and let them know what the faintest star is that you can see. So that helps give a lot of information, a lot of data, and helps us really understand the trends of light pollution and what we can do to combat that. Um, and then for personal use, uh, just if you're looking at apps, a lot of phones already have this, um, but if you wanna try to kind of boost your melatonin production again, just either turn off your electronics at least 30 minutes before you go to bed to allow your body to shut down, or if you're like a lot of us and that is hard to do, um, make sure you have red light apps on your phone or your computer that will change that blue light to a red light. Um, Laura was kind of hinting at this, but red light is better at night. Um, blue light kind of keeps us awake a little bit more as well. It's harder for our body to shut down. So that's partly why you see number five saying choose warm white light bulbs. Light, uh, red is a warm light. Um, so that kind of helps our body shut down and actually go to bed rather than stay up and, and cause some of those harmful effects to us. So uh, we do encourage you, no matter where you are, to at least go out and start to look up, try to find some of the really cool things that Laura mentioned, um, look up at the moon, look up at the stars, try to identify the constellations, 
just rediscover the brilliance of the night sky yourself. It's really quite magical. So that was the end of what Kelly and I wanted to talk about today. Um, thank you, Kelly. That was, um, I think, really important to be able to hear so that we can start to know how to reconnect with the night sky. So at this point, we will take questions. All right. So some of you have noticed that um, there uh, is a chat function in Zoom. <clears throat> I think most of you are aware of that by now. So just type your questions into the chat and I will relay them uh, to our speakers, to uh, Laura and Kelly uh, as appropriate. So um, go ahead and do that. We have a few questions already and I'll start relaying those. Um, why don't we ask Laura and Kelly to turn on your videos so people can see you and um, we'll start going through some of the questions. <clears throat> the first one I have is from Abby and uh, Laura, you've actually already answered this um, in the middle of your talk, but you might want to repeat it for people who are interested. And that is, um, she mentioned that seeing Andromeda through binoculars was really incredible. Is it visible this time of year? And you pointed out how that was uh, very close to the sun and uh, only shows up in the sky near dawn. So could you uh, say a few words about that again? Yes, definitely. So Andromeda, the galaxy Andromeda is right here. It's in these crosshairs here. Um, and it is also right near Pegasus. Um, and then Pegasus back feet turned into Andromeda. So this is at 545 in the morning. Um, as the so I'm advancing the day here and so at that same time it will start to come above the horizon a bit more um, but I think we will have to wait until summertime for it to probably come far enough above the mountains for us to be able to see um, but Andromeda is gorgeous it's also very massive it's on the order of the size of the moon which I um, I for one didn't realize um, until I came across that fact. Um, but while it is gorgeous in binoculars and a telescope, it probably won't be high enough in the sky until, let's see. So this is beginning of June. Um, and so you can see here that it's, ooh. Um, and that this is six in the morning. I turned off atmosphere, so that's why it kind of looks weird. But so let's go to, oh, here we go. So if we keep advancing time, right? So now this is July and August. And if we turn the clock back a couple of hours, we still see that Andromeda is very low in the sky. So maybe this isn't even fall time. So this is October, mid-October at nine o'clock, almost 10 at night. So. Andromeda might be better classified as a fall time object to look at, but it's just starting to become above the horizon um, now, right before sunrise. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, uh, we have a comment from John who lives in White Rock. He says he has an unshielded streetlight that illuminates his backyard quite well. Uh, he doesn't believe that that's the most beneficial, efficient and cost-effective use of resources. So light trespass is a, a real thing. Um, I've got some of that in my neighborhood as well. Uh, I um, built a, a little deck on the back of the house that's for the pets, but also so I can set a little telescope up there. And then uh, a couple of years after the house was built, uh, the county installed four streetlights uh, within right around my house because I'm on a corner. So that kind of wiped out my astronomy. Um, but more importantly, uh, some of you may have noticed if you've driven past the, um, uh, the new roundabout in uh, Los Alamos, uh, Trinity and, and Central, um, that the lights there are just horrendously bright and the county uh, or the, the construction company says that's required by the state. Uh, although most other intersections 
uh, that the state has jurisdiction over do not have such bright lights. So um, if you have a chance, you might want to drive through there. And if it irritates you or the glare is as bad for you as it is for some of us, you might want to consider mentioning that to the county council. Um, the, uh, we do have uh, an activity here in Los Alamos uh, called the Amos Mountain Night Sky Consortium. And it was started by Peak and a few other folks um, here in Los Alamos. Uh, the um, nearby parks are also a part of that. Uh, and in fact, uh, Kelly can tell you more about the um, the um, uh, the, the night sky designation that uh, one of the parks is working on. Uh, and maybe Kelly, I don't know how familiar you are yet. I know you haven't been in town very long with this night sky consortium, but could you say a few words about that? Um, sure, yeah, I, like you said, I've, I haven't been in town long, so it's only been a little over a month for me, but hmm. um, Vias Caldera, uh, did just a few months ago get their certification as an international dark sky park. Um, there are pullouts along um, New Mexico Route 4 that are kind of designated as that 24 hour um, site for, for you to be stargazing. Um, it's still quite cold up there at night. So I don't know if you wanna go stargazing when it's cold, um, it's up to you guys, but. Uh, yeah, and I know Bandelier is working on theirs as well. Um, I can't really speak to that. I haven't spoken to anyone at Bandelier um, yet, but it's it's an arduous process just to get that certification. Um, at least with the park side, um, we have, uh, basically we have to do four outreach events every year. Um, this would count as one. Um, and obviously we'll see what happens with COVID, but hopefully we'll keep our fingers crossed that we can start to do in-person events at least later in the summer. Um, we need to take measurements of the night sky. Um, we, you know, work on reducing our light pollution in the park, which granted, I mean, we're a newer park site anyway, but basically when you're going through that process, you document every single light that you have um, and which ones, um, you know, are night sky friendly lighting, which ones can be improved? Are they historic? Or are they not? Um, so you go through this whole process, you develop a lighting management plan, you have to communicate with partners and get recommendations. So it's a really long process. So it's not just like, hey, I want to be an international dark sky park, you have to really prove it. And um, those folks that went through that process at Vias Caldera, um, before I arrived, really did a lot of work. So yeah, come up and see the night skies. Brave the cold. It's a really great place to, to see the, uh, the night sky. It's just a little glow in the horizon from Albuquerque and a little from Santa Fe, but it's very minimal compared to what we have here in Los Alamos, just because of the Los Alamos uh, lighting. Um, there is uh, a project uh, that is looking at um, making suggestions to the Los Alamos County um, codes for lighting um, that are being rewritten this year. Uh, and uh, you can get more information about that process, perhaps not quite yet, but um, hopefully soon in the next few weeks. Uh, if you go to peaknature.org, there should be a pointer to a website for the Amos Mountain Dark Sky Initiative um, Consortium, and they will, uh, that will give you some more information about that. Uh, Steve mentions that the county will eventually install shields on some of their lights if you request it. That depends a little bit on what type of lights are in your area, uh, but you can also try that if you're having problems with glare in your uh, in your neighborhood. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, John also says on iPhones you can create a preset function through the accessibility section to turn on or off a red filter that works on any app or display, which is great for night use. I think it's uh, maybe called uh, nighttime uh, lighting or something like that. It's actually more of a, a yellowish filter, um, but that is on the iPhones. It's on all the, the ones that can run the, the latest operating system. So that's easy to turn on and off uh, if you want to look into that. Uh, it was designed especially for reading with your phone uh, right before you go to bed. So uh, 
They've got yeah, I know. Covered. When I first started giving um, programs on light pollution, like I don't have an iPhone and people, and I also have like older phones usually. And I was like, oh yeah, you can download apps like Twilight and, and all of this. And they were like, um, it's already on our phone. We just have to turn it on. So yeah, making, making that, uh, looking through your phone to see what apps I guess are already preloaded on it is really beneficial sometimes. So okay. we don't have to download new ones. Yeah, and John mentions that in addition to the feature that I was mentioning, there is this separate feature uh, in the accessibility section to turn on and off um, a uh, red filter. So there are a couple different ways you can access these kinds of things, uh, at least with iPhones. I just am not familiar with other kinds of phones. So um, that's what we have so far. Let me ask one last time and give a few seconds for typing if anyone has any questions for Laura or Kelly. Okay, well, thank you again, Laura and Kelly, very much for your time and that information that you put together for us. We really appreciate that. Uh, check out peaknature.org for details on future activities. We have some uh, activities coming up uh, next week uh, with uh, uh, yeah, kind of pointed toward uh, the dark sky week. Uh, activities. So check those out. And we hope to see you again soon at one of our Friday evening astronomy talks. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Night.